You were sent for water. You were sent to get help. You rode as fast as you could. You didn't waste a moment. But upon your return, corpses, blood, everywhere in sight. Commander Francisco Pelserth of the Batavia lived the horror of this exact experience. The Batavia was the newly found flagship of the famed Dutch East India Company of the 17th century, proudly named after their colonized capital. Yet all the passengers aboard the 650-ton ship were not exactly accounted for. More troublingly, just a matter of miles from the capital, the flagship struck a reef, and what followed was unimaginable. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we look at the deadliest shipwreck, and not because the ship sank. Constructed in Amsterdam in 1628, the Batavia was meant to be the pride of the Dutch East India Company. Its title was taken from the capital of the Dutch East Indies, or as you and I would rightfully know it now, Indonesia. Its maiden voyage set off from the Northern Netherlands to the capital of the Dutch East Indies in October 1628. The commander of the ship was Francisco Palser, with Ariane Jacobs as the ship's skipper. There was some bad blood between the two men following a drunken altercation between the two previously. Also on board was a man by the name of Jeronimus Cornelis, a bankrupt man on the run from Holland living in fear of being arrested by the authorities. Amazingly, on this famed voyage of a major maritime shipping company, both Cornelis and Jacobs plotted a mutiny to take control of the ship. They planned to use the gold and silver on board to enrich themselves and start their lives again elsewhere. While the mutiny wasn't to be, fate struck and the Batavia's destiny was forever altered. Sailing around the west coast of Australia in June 1629, the ship struck the Morning Reef around Beacon Island. Badly damaged, the ship began sinking, and the majority of its 322 passengers were able to make it to shore, though around 40 drowned in the process of attempting to escape from the doomed vessel. Little did the survivors know the horror ahead of them was much worse than the sinking of their ship. The shipwreck of the Batavia would have been a terrifying experience to all those on board, though the journey itself was quite literally not plain sailing. Commander Pelserit's account of the events tells of the threat the passengers faced on board before the Batavia even struck the Morning Reef. According to the commander, skipper Arjen Jacobs and his accomplice Euronymous Cornelis did their best to stir a mutiny. The Batavia stopped at South Africa's Cape of Good Hope on its voyage, yet on setting sail, Jacobs intentionally steered the vessel off course, veering it away from its fleet. This was the prelude to a disturbing attempt at manufacturing a mutiny. Jacobs and Cornelis gathered men on board to sexually assault Lucretia Jans, a female passenger on the voyage. This, according to the rapt logic of the two architects, was to raise Pelsart into taking disciplinary measures on the crew. The hope was that the discipline would be felt as injustice on the crew, and that both Jacobs and Cornelis would recruit aggrieved crew members for mutiny. Thank goodness the plan didn't go as hoped. Lucretia Jans rightfully named her attackers, and the crew was relieved of any blame for this grim design. Mutiny had been averted, even if the measures to attempt it are frankly stomach-turning. Pertinently to this tale, Cornelis has shown his true colors. Francisco Pelsart had a world of responsibility on his shoulders following the sinking of the Batavia. A crew of Pelsart, Jacobs, several officers and men surveyed the land of small reef islands surrounding them. They saw no fresh water and limited opportunities for food. As the commander, Pelsart made it his number one responsibility to get help and made his priority sailing to Batavia, the location, to assure this. This meant Pelsart and his crew taking a longboat and making a dangerous voyage north to reach the Indonesian capital. However, this journey would take the men some 30 plus days. In the majority, the survivors were left stranded on the reef islands, but most perilous, the man left in charge of the survivors and their safety was one Jeronimus Cornelius, no commander, officer, or sailor. An anonymous opportunist was elected to take charge of the survivors, and not one of them could have imagined the carnage ahead. Cornelis struck his twisted vision of gold with the unwarranted authority he was granted. A figure lost in either fantasy or grandiosity, Cornelis was ready to hijack and rescue the ship that made it back to the island. 
His vision was that he would take the gold and silver from the wreck and start a new kingdom, no less. Yet Cornelius was seemingly aware his plans may have opposition, and he did his utmost to take out any. In his first power grab, Cornelius placed all food supplies and any available weapons brought to him to be under his control. Second, and in a sly piece of maneuvering, Cornelius commanded a group of soldiers to search for fresh water on the West Wallaby Island some five or so miles west. The search for water was all pretense. Cornelius sent the men in hopes of them being led astray, finding nothing in his ideal that they would never come back. This left the delusional and dangerous Cornelius alone with unarmed survivors. Cornelius, on a proto-Colonel Kurtz vibe, soon began a radical form of population control. In his addled mind, the man in charge decided the best hope they had to make supplies last was to reduce the population to under 50 people. Over the weeks, with the help of aligned henchmen, Cornelis conducted a murder spree that spared none. Men, women, and children were all murdered by his orders. Cornelis rarely engaged in the killing himself. He would threaten others into the barbarous act. As the weeks unraveled, what had been killing in the name of saving themselves had turned into wanton murder. At its rotten core, Cornelis's rule was void of all humanity. Accounts dictate he attempted to poison a baby at one point. The murder count rose to as many as 110 innocent parties killed in broad daylight. Chillingly, women faced a dire threat to their safety amongst all the murders. A few women were used and kept as sex slaves for Cornelis' henchmen. Worst of all, Lucretia Jans, who had survived a premeditated assault from Cornelis, was personally coerced to be his sex slave. Karma may well exist. The survivors and the massacre injured were soon found by returning rescuers. Cornelis and his men went to fight off the rescuers with their mad vision of a new kingdom ahead, but were easily defeated. A trial was conducted on the island. Cornelis and his men had their hands chopped off before execution. Of the 322 or so who set sail from Holland on the Batavia, only around 120 ever made it back to the Dutch East Indies capital. As for Cornelis and his men, who would be the first Europeans to be executed in Australia, if you can't do the time, The Batavia and its litany of traumas was not the only discovery it would offer future epochs and generations. While the rescue vessel Sardam would take 10 of the 12 original treasure chests on board the Batavia at the time, the sunken vessel would capture the fascination of those to come. In the 1950s, it was declared by Australian journalists that the wreck of the Batavia lay in the Wallaby group of islands and was first seen in the 1960s and in the 1970s salvage of the wreckage began. A remarkable amount of salvage was claimed from the three centuries old site. Hull timbers, cannons, and port side stern timbers were all found at the site. Many were transferred to be displayed at the Western Australian Museum, and the wreck itself has gone on to be one of the coast's number one diving spots. Horror and bloodshed wouldn't be the only memorialization of the Batavia. Over a 10-year process finishing in 1995, a replica was faithfully rebuilt using the same materials and construction of its time. The reconstruction was a hybrid of studied wreckage, modern accounts of the vessel, and designs of modern ships. The brand new Batavia would have successful voyages in commemoration of its original before being moored in Leistad, Netherlands. It remains there to this day, functioning as a nautical museum for all things Batavia. A much frowned upon adage these days, but was Cornelius the one bad apple that ruined the Batavia's batch? Or just another malevolent opportunist for whom we should all be watchful? This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.